Hi, welcome again to the Focus uh, podcast. And today's episode, we'll be interviewing Alan Heskith. I'm Aldu Roll and I'm Horia Slushansky. Welcome. So, Alan, um, one of the things that we do in our podcast is we start by explaining uh, why do we have our interviewee on our podcast. And um, I'll be uh, the first to admit that I've been very impressed with Alan when a few weeks ago uh, we both uh, served on a panel discussing um, governance in the context of project management in various ways. And um, Alan's incisive perspective, um, uh, I found to be very, very appealing. And Alan has graciously um, accepted to join us on the podcast. So Thank Alan, you. tell us a little bit about your river of life. Um, so I've been in CIO, CDO, um, digital leadership positions for the best part of well, more than 30 years now. Um, so I have seen a real evolution of the industry. Um, I've had opportunities to actually work in public sector, private sector, as well as um, internationally. So I live in New Zealand, so I've um, lived and worked in Africa and Europe and done global roles for multinationals. Um, so very, very broad base of experience that I can bring to the subject. And I've had the opportunity to actually do some real um, leading stuff in different marketplaces, which has um, always been a lot of fun. Um, but ultimately, it all comes down to that focus on business value. Mm. That's fantastic. Now, um, you wrote um, a really nice book called Start Fast. Uh, tell us a bit what inspired you to, to write this book. Well, I think one of the real challenges for people today is the pace of change. One of the quotes from the book is from Justin Trudeau, uh, Prime Minister of Canada. I think he still is. And the, he, his quote was basically, the, the pace of change has never been as fast as it has been as it is today, and it will never be the slow again. So the way I think the way organisations need to deliver change, they need a quite a a different approach to that which I think most traditional organizations, most organizations actually bring. And so the book is really trying, looking to address that problem. How do we help organizations deliver value from digital, the use of digital technologies more quickly and more effectively? Now, you have a really interesting model uh, in the book of uh, digital transformation involving an intersection of value integration and evolution. Yeah. Uh, walk us through this, this um, model and what insights led you to uh, propose this model? The, well, if you just think of it, so digital transformation um, is, or is the core of it, the value you get from business value for digital transformation. And, and that's really the why. Um, so you start with the, start with the why. Um, and I talk a lot in the book about human-centered value, um, that I, I very firmly believe that if your digital transformation is not helping people live better, work better, enjoy their life better, then I think we're wasting our investment quite dramatically. So the value is about the why. Then the integrate, the, the way we actually bring together the new with the old. And that's looking at how people work, how processes operate within an organization and integrating the new technology with the old. I don't think any organization is going to have the flexibility to actually throw away stuff they've already got. It's just not reality. Every company has a legacy. And so any work we do around digital transformation needs to think about how we can actually integrate the way we do things today with the way we want to do them tomorrow and manage that transition effectively. So that's the what we're changing. And, and the how we're changing is the third part of that, um, the evolve. So that's looking at that a continuous improvement process or a continuous change process that organisations need to think about doing. The um, statistics, I think, say the work within an organization now has changed from 80% operational, 20% project to more like more the other way around, that 20% operational and 80% project or change activity. 
And how you approach that, I think, is really critical. Trying to do a revolutionary change is high risk, takes a lot of time, mm. and I don't think delivers value fast enough. So mm. very much think about evolution. So it's the why, the value, the, the what, the integrate, and the how for the evolution to really deliver that business value. You've been keeping, uh, you've been talking quite a lot about uh, that focus on business value um, <clears throat> and um, uh, value throughout those stages that, that you've discussed. You've, you, you keep talking about the why, uh, why, why are we doing this? Um, one thing I wanted to uh, just bring back into the conversation, you quoted Tradu uh, on, um, you know, change is going to happen so fast. Um, it tells me that there's quite an art to being able to articulate that why or that value so that you don't have to do so every month. Um, that, that, that type of, um, uh, my, my question here is, let, let, let's rephrase that, is by focusing on the business value, the, the, what do you do in order to keep to the art of articulating in such a way that it's not history next month? Yeah, the, uh, I use the analogy or the metaphor in the book of a long distance swim. Yeah. Um, and, and I find that it actually highlights a lot of the challenges about digital transformation quite effectively. Now, why swimming? I'm a swimmer. I love swimming. I do long, <clears throat> I enjoy long distance swims. One of the things about them is you start with the end point in mind. You know where you're going. And, and that generally doesn't change very often. So that you've, you, you know, I'm going to swim 5K. Um, I've got to go around these couple of headlands and I'm going to land at that beach a couple further down the coast. Um, you've got an end in mind. Mm. And your whole way through that swim, that end, that target stays with you. It doesn't change, right? I'm heading for that beach. But mm. on the way, you're actually going to go through, you're going to go through changing tides, changing swells. Um, somebody made the comment to me, you're even going to have some predators out there. I used to... <laughs> <laughs> um, live on the sun, have, live on the Sunshine Coast, just north of Brisbane, and um, so sharks were always a top of mind when we were swimming for some strange reason. But there's always these things that are going to come and interfere with how you swim. If all you do is try to swim directly towards your endpoint, you're not going to get there because your tides are going to drag you off. The wind's going to push you off course. So you have to be constantly stopping and looking up and checking: Is what I'm doing right now? helping me in the best way possible get to that beach, get to mm. that end point. And I think for me, that's the translate, translating that into the digital transformation. It's you've got, you've all got that shared vision of what that beach is and where it is. And then each decision you take about the next change that you're going to do in your evolution, how is this helping me get to that beach? Mm. Right. Am I going to be wasting a lot of energy because I'm going to be swimming against the tide? Or am I actually better to, to go across the tide and, and take a different route around the headland that I'm trying to navigate? I'm constantly thinking about is the thing that I'm doing next the best, the ne the best next activity or the yeah, next best activity to get me to that beach as quickly as I can? Mm. Yeah, uh, considering things systemically like this, thinking strategically, I think is um, is fantastic um, as a general approach. Now, one fly in the ointment, if you will, uh, one uh, factor that often interferes with a smooth running of organizations is unplanned and hidden work. What are your thoughts on <laughs> on this bane of our existence? Um, you've always got a choice. The, I mean, there's a really good book called um, Making Work Visible. Mm. Um, and in that book, it talks about the five thieves of time. And one of them is, is hidden work. Um, and that, that brings into the whole issue of how do you manage your actual work in progress, um, the, the current load on your team. And I think the critical thing is to make sure your team is never overloaded. Mm. Um, I think one of the worst things that organizations do today is demand, just keep pushing new work on top of the team's 
that yeah. are actually responsible for building and delivering yeah. Yeah. The capabilities, pushing new change out to the user population, um, the consumers of these services, when the previous ones haven't um, really cemented into place and they're not getting the full value out of it. Mm. So yeah. I think the it was a it was interesting. The um, I, I was at that session, Maria, you were talking about. I was talking about kind of the minimal governance model, and, and I was talking about um, basically portfolio program and uh, performance. I think was the third one. Um, the the three major the three major components was understanding what are you going to do in the future what are we doing today and how are we getting the profit um, and the value out of what we've already finished? Um, and I think those that you have to understand how much resource each of those three areas mm. is actually consuming and that you've got the balance right. So that in the, when you're doing the, you're performing the projects, um, it's the, not overloading people so that when the unexpected things come up, they have some slack to be able to react to it. Mm. And the, the, the kind of the oversight, the team doing the oversight needs to allow the teams the flexibility to be straight about these unexpected things that are hitting them. Mm. Make it safe, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, in terms of that... Uh, um, you know this hidden work. Um, let's talk about another type of work that that I notice that teams um, are supposed to work on, but there's never enough time because if anything else takes more priority, or they don't see it as as a, just a different type of work. And you spoke in your model about this continuous improvement that entails quite a lot of work as well. And many yes. teams and organizations don't think in terms of this is still work. It's just another type of work. It doesn't deliver a widget or a whiz bang to our customers, but it's still valuable work. Um, how do you uh, propose um, organizations deal with that in light of what you just shared with us? Well, the continuous improvement is about increasing your output, increasing your productivity. So delivering more output for less input. <clears throat> and in theory, that if you're doing the right things, then that increased output increases the value you're delivering to your customers. So the investment in the continuous improvement of your build teams, of your development teams, is an investment for accelerating the delivery of value in the future to your customers. So that if you're thinking about each change, each improvement you do, as part of that operational delivery cycle with a very clear understanding that this has got to, we've got to link this to how this is going to benefit our customers, yeah. um, our team members, our partners, the people that we deliver value to um, in the future. If, you, if that linkage is strong, the discussion around continuous improvement is really easy. Mm. There's usually a breakdown of discipline around that continuous improvement though. You, 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 for what I've noticed is that, yes, we're in, we got to improve, we're going to improve, and here's the improvement. And then when you ask them a week later, right, how's that improvement going? How are we tracking it? Um, what, what have you found? They go, oh, uh, no, we're too busy. <laughs> <laughs> then, but it, because again, it's part of the team's workload, it's part yeah. of work in progress. You yeah. cannot, you cannot be choose that okay we want you to do continuous improvement oh but that's on top of everything else that you're doing <laughs> that's usually the that, that it, it has no but but again this is the thing where the linkage to improving your productivity so improving outcomes for the customer in the future there has to be a certain amount of investment mm -hmm. in the team to do that it's not going to be 80 percent of the team's time and money but it might be 15 percent mm -hmm. And that has to be intentional. It can't be accidental. The oversight organization, the, the governance team has to recognize they have the accountability as well for the productivity of that team. If you're not, I mean, I, I have this saying mm. I, keep, I keep using that yesterday's excellence is tomorrow's expectation. So what are you doing today? 
that's on your uh, on your Zoom uh, background when you when this, your live video is yep. not on. Yes, yes, I saw that. And it, it's that constant that's constant reminder that we've got to give to organisations. The pace of change is accelerating. People's expectation is increasing continuously. And so if you're not continuously improving what you're doing, you're falling behind. Mm -hmm. And therein lies a really interesting challenge of how do we make it so that uh, we don't succumb to panic and despair to say, oh my God, we're never going to be able to, uh, to make it and change that more into a feeling of, right, we are getting stronger, we are getting better, and we are good yeah, and getting better. Yeah. I used to run with some of the team, with the teams I've led, I used to run this um, process that I used to call lemons and roses. Mm -hmm. um, lemons was learning experience of the month. It was kind of like, how did we screw up? Yeah. But most importantly, what did we learn from it? And in and a, and a couple of the organizations, we actually had uh, this plastic lemon stuck on a wooden plinth on a nail. Um, <laughs> so and cool. we gave that award to a team each month to sort of say, you guys, yeah, you made a mistake, but boy, yeah. look how much you've learned and yeah. how much we've improved as a result of it. So the, it's recognizing um, you learn or you win. Mm. It's kind of celebrate what you're learning as much as celebrate what you're winning. Yeah. Um, because both build your future. The, the roses, I think, is an important part, stopping and smelling them. Mm -hmm. Now, my, my natural inclination is to just get on and do the next thing without actually celebrating much. And a lot of the organizations uh, I've worked with have been that way, that succeeding means we get to play again. We mm. get to do the next thing. But for a lot of people, that's not sufficient. And so we used to, we, we had the smelling the roses um, part of the event as well. So the lemons and the roses, we celebrated we, our learnings and we celebrated our wins, the things we'd actually delivered. And, and it was a conscious decision to stop and celebrate the things that we'd done well. And people enjoy that. And that's the thing that I think gives people the, the energy for the next step. We've succeeded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, celebration is is yeah. such an um, underused technique in, in leadership in organizations. And it's right? so easy, and yeah. and, it's yeah. so, and it's literally so yeah. easy to do that. Um, it just takes a bit of conscious and bit of intentionality yeah. to, to put it into the the team meetings. Now, how much and more... getting people getting getting people to talk about what they've achieved or what they've done, and and the fun they had doing it is just so. It's so cool to see people light up in that way. It's That's story right. Telling. It's storytelling, yeah. It's so much nicer to be acknowledged for what you're doing as opposed to just taken for granted, right? So you've done a great thing. So what? You want a, a medal now? <laughs> yeah, I want a medal. Why not? <laughs> but the thing, I, thing I've found is that often just, just being able to stand up in front of your peers and say, this is what we achieved. Yeah. And to get that recognition from your peers and your friends um, yeah. actually means as much as any extrinsic award, extrinsic award we can actually give to people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. They get this, hey, they get this cool feeling inside. Yeah. I've done, yeah, hey, people think I've done something cool. That's I'm not right. so sure it's so cool, but they think it's cool. Yeah. So it must so have been. Good. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll do more. Yeah. So it, it energizes you to redouble what you're doing. Now, yeah. um, changing tack just briefly, um, I've noticed that you're recommending that leaders don't jump into yeah. digital transformations uh, with a structural organization. Right. In other words, not just a um, move deck chairs on the Titanic kind of thing. Um, you uh, instead advocate for uh, patiently improving the flow of work in value streams, which yeah. then over time naturally engages people and gives them um, the impetus to, to push for a structural realignment all by themselves. Tell us more about your thinking. Well, it's I've been involved in a lot of different reorganizations in my time for all sorts of different motivations. And the ones that I've found work best are those when the people who are the change, the change is being done to are actually highly engaged in what's changing. Mm. And so the going back to that kind of the, the how you're changing, the evolution, 
Um, at times, large reorganisations necessary. I started a government organisation here in New Zealand and I took over um, a number of different teams that had not worked together previously. And so that we had to um, figure out how to work as, a, as this kind of unitary organisation quite quickly. And, and there's five, 600 people um, that I was responsible for. And so we took a group of 20 people away, some of the key influencers and leaders, and actually sat down and, and um, with some, very, some interesting storming, um, we actually worked through what should this organisation actually look like. And then we actually went out and we communicated very clearly why we were making these changes and why this was actually going to help people do their jobs better. Um, it was the, I think the, the, the metric that I looked at uh, six or seven months later was our turnover um, was almost non-existent during that period. Wow. Um, so That's whilst we, we, we reorganized very quickly, but we did it in a way that the teams we were changing were heavily involved and constantly communicated with about what's, at least that was my intention. <laughs> so you probably ask the people of the teams and they probably give you a different story, but, um, but looking at it, the, the turnover that we had and the levels of engagement levels we had, um, I don't believe that was the case. But that's an exception. Um, mm. You don't normally have those kinds of um, dramatic changes that often the reorganization is your the people are thinking about is in reaction to normal evolution of your business environment. And I think that trying to rush that before you actually understand the implications um, are going uh, putting you at a much greater risk yeah. mm. uh, than if you evolve it steadily yeah. and work with the people that are being affected about it. Yeah. How do you how do I make it easier for you to do your job? to achieve the outcomes that our customers actually want. Because that's the thing. It's not the structure that generates the outcome. It's the human relationships, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. yeah. 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 And often, and, and often if, if, some, if, if you're having to combine two or three areas that have two or three leaders, that often it's easier to get those three to sit down and agree how we're going to address this. Um, and focus on those three working together so their teams work together effectively mm, rather yeah. than having to move people around. If yeah. they got a common outcome and they're rewarded with common incentives, they have a reason for working together. Mm. Now, here's a, here's a challenging obstacle that I find from time to time. Um, um, let me define a toxic culture. Uh, a toxic culture is one in which um, people in position of authority are abusing their authority. They engage in, shall we say, somewhat uh, psychopathic habits, um, seeking benefit just for the self, despite the pain and um, difficulty that they cause for others. So what I would ask is, what thoughts do you have on us um, figuring out how to detoxify cultures such that they're more amenable to effective digital transformations? Simplistic answer, change the people or change the people. <laughs> 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 so it's a case of, so the person that's actually demonstrating the psychopathic behavior or the sociopathic mm -hmm. behavior, they're, mm -hmm. um, they're more common in our business environment than we like to admit, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the organization, so it's the organization that actually has to take accountability. They pointed that person into the role. Yeah, yeah, um, that's right. And, and if, I, if I have accountability for the person, if they, they are part of my team, then, then it's my accountability and responsibility to actually change the person, get them to change their behavior. Yeah. And if they don't change their behavior, change the person. Because the, there's nobody needs to have a toxic person in their environment. It's just yeah. not, it's not fair. It's not acceptable. There was one, so I did, I, uh, organization I joined in Australia. Um, and again, I was merging multiple teams together. And one of the conditions I put, it was a public sector organization. One of the conditions I put on it um, with the CEO was basically, I want to be able to remove people if I need to. This mm -hmm. is a public sector organization. So 
um, it's not always that simple to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I had that backing behind me. Um, and again, it was a team of, of, of about 600 people that I, was, um, that I was starting to work with. And there were two or three very toxic people in there. And there were two or three others who chose not to engage and, and in a sense, white, white entered the, um, the process so that they, they just didn't help the change. They weren't mm. directly affecting other people. Um, so I, I removed six people from that organization over a three-month period, um, gave them an opportunity to engage with the direction mm. that we were going with. Um, and if they chose not to, then we, we agreed on how they would exit. Mm. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's as simple as change the people or change the people. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Unfortunately. One thing, okay, one, go one ahead, thing, Sorry. We, one thing we, we do notice is that usually uh, in many cases, not in many cases, but usually there's also an element of the environment that tolerates that, that behavior. Yeah. Absolutely. And sometimes incentivizes that behavior. Um, is, is, it, is it also not just a case of changing some of the structure or the, the environment for that toxicity? If somebody's getting some value from that toxicity. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, that's why they continue to allow it to happen. Yeah. Um, and if it's, a, if it's a senior person in the organization and I, and I don't have any, I can't have any impact on that person changing that behavior, um, I change, I go. Okay. Um, life's, life's, sorry, life's too short. Yeah. Yeah. With, with that kind of crap. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and the, and I know not everybody has that choice or, or that, that kind of freedom. Mm. But I think if the organization is allowing, or even, or as you mentioned, even incentivizing kind of toxic behavior, then why does that organization actually exist? Because who, who, who gains value from the toxicity in the yeah. long term? Well, uh, particularly in the commercial sector, um, that is easier to detect and punish. In the social sector, um, we find, I mean, I've seen this both in uh, Australian and New Zealand organizations. Um, it's a lot harder to, to hold people to account. Because mm. uh, also there's a feeling from the senior executives that actually this is going on in my organizations and I don't know what to do uh, with it. I'm too embarrassed to, to actually confront this. So I'm going to uh, let it continue. So uh, this is where I think um, it's going to be really Change fascinating. Yeah, exactly. Um, we need, um, and the, the thing is, um, I'm personally very interested in finding ways to help people to redeem themselves as opposed to simply saying, oh, uh, off with your head, uh, kind mm -hmm. of thing, yep. right? I'd oh, much rather... Much, yep, I'm with you. Yeah. I'm with you. I, I would much, I, I mean, I've, I've ended up in, a, in the labor, I mean, I've done quite a lot of reorganizations in some very litigious um, mm -hmm. labor law environments. And I've ended up in a labor court once. Um, and we won that case. And the, 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 we'd gone in with the approach that the person that we were talking, that we were working with, um, he'd been promoted beyond what he was actually capable of. Um, and so we were going to put him into a role that he could actually do, he was mm. capable of doing. We, would, um, we weren't going to reduce the salary, we were going to leave him on his current salary, but we weren't going to increase it over time until he got into parity with the people at the same kind of level as him, because the organization put him into that position. Um, and, and I think that's just unfair. Um, and, but he wouldn't accept that. Um, and we, as I said, we ended up in the labor court, but um, we, we really had done, and the court commented on this, that we had really done everything we could to help him end up in a good situation. Um, and the, and I think that's all you can do. Yeah, um, that's right. The, yep. the, the person themselves has to choose to take advantage of the opportunity they're being given. I mean, I can't, I can't change people. I can only change the environment in mm. which they're working. Yeah, yeah.
That's um, uh, that, that's so true. Is is you know seize the day, or the day will seize you. It's as easy <laughs> as that. So, Alan, your book, uh, uh, the the title is called Starting Fast, but you're you're emphasizing the concept in the book on starting fast. Please explain that for us a little bit, please. The it's it's about making choices. Mm. The I, I, I've watched organisations go through extensive strategic planning exercises on on how they're going to achieve things, but I've never really seen any of them actually where where they've been. They've developed detailed execution plans and started executing to the plan, but I've never seen any organisations actually successfully complete those plans. I mean, there's the old cliche that plans never survive first contact with the enemy. And so if you spend months planning an exercise where the plan's going to be wrong probably before you even start, yeah. why are you spending so much time doing it? I actually think you're much better off deciding what are my most important things to do right now? Mm. Like what are the things I should be starting fast right now and get on with those? Right? Keep my long to keep that beach in mind, keep that long-term endpoint in mind. Um, and everything you do should be moving you in that direction. Yeah. And yeah. It isn't. And when you're doing a long distance swim like that, it isn't just the next stroke, the next stroke. You've, you've, we've normally blocked it into P pieces of the swim, sort of around a headland, across the face of the beach, um, that we've, we've chunked it down into different components. Um, and, but they're not planned in detail. Mm. Um, they are a there are a kind of a chunks of work that we know we're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. right? We think we understand how we're going to do it, but by the time we get to there, the situation is going to be different. The conditions changed, yes, absolutely. So doing detailed planning um, <clears throat> of what's going to happen in the swim in three and a half kilometers time is really not very productive. That you need to be ready for the different things that might be coming at you so you can actually react quickly. But that keeps meaning you're sticking your head up and you're watching what's coming at you and checking your direction mm -hmm. and checking that you're actually advancing effectively. You're explaining an OODA loop right there. <laughs> yeah, observe, orient, decide, and act. Yes. That's absolutely mm -hmm. right. Now, uh, one thing that I like very much in your book is you, you bring all sorts of anecdotes. And one of them that uh, inspired me was um, where you mentioned the chief executive actually visiting, this is in a retail environment, and noticing something amiss. Oh. Uh, in the actual store. Well, that was uh, just embarrassing, actually. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's fascinating because that essentially says, aha, this is what is actually going on. Therefore, yeah. by taking a clear grasp of what's actually going on, you can then determine what's most important to do. Exactly. <laughs> otherwise, yep. you have an, an idealized notion of what's what should be in the business or what the yeah. rosy reports are saying, and you're failing to notice what's actually going on. So tell us a bit more about what would you advise senior executives to consider to develop a better grasp of current situations? Well, that, that CEO had a phrase he used frequently, um, which was basically, you're either serving the customer or you're helping someone who is serving a customer. Mm. And so the whole culture of the, and values of the organization was centered around helping each other to deliver great experience. And I think the that if you don't get out and see the experience, experience the experience that your customers are actually getting, that you really don't understand the job that people are doing on, on those, those kind of edges that where you're dealing with the customer every day. Mm -hmm. that, that particular mm -hmm. one was I just started with a large retailer and um, two, two or three weeks in, I get this call from our CEO, my boss, and he basically says, the store's not trading. So I go and look at the, the help desk system and there's no call from the store. Um, so I get on the phone and talk to the store manager um, and, and basically just ask what's going on. And so I'm two or three weeks in. And so I'm, I know nothing at this point in time, really, about what's going on in the organisation. And he just says, oh, yeah, that's normal. Point of sale systems fall over three or four times a day. We just restart them. We'll, 
why don't you ring, ring up and tell us about it? Well, we have for a long time, but the self-service desk just tells us to turn them off and turn them on. And so that's just what we do now. Wow. And, and, it is, and it, at no point had people really thought about the fact that this is such a bad experience. The customer's waiting mm. to check out and they can't because the computer's fail. Um, and so we actually, that having, and the interesting thing was the development team that, that maintained the software wasn't aware of those issues. Um, so when we actually, we, put, we, we changed the point of sale system. So we actually had some real monitoring as to what was going on. And I remember the first day the team leader came in to see me. So we turned it on two o'clock in the morning when we applied point of sale fixes. And she was checking the, um, the actual error logs at about eight o'clock in the morning. And in that six hours, it'd been something like 100,000 errors actually recorded Ooh, wow. uh, from, the point of, from the point of sale across. Um, I mean, Pareto obviously applies 80, 20, 20% 20 of our problems were driving a big part of those volumes. So within two right. weeks, that was, down, that was down to one or two, um, one or two a day. Um, and so that we, it's understanding what is the real experience you're delivering to people is so critical to driving work. If you're doing it on, I think this is going to work best for my customer without actually verifying it with them, then you're going to deliver something that, that may or may not succeed. Mm. Um, I I'd rather be, be prepared to do something that's more likely than less likely to, to succeed. So Hire talks about uh, that uh, everybody needs to be accountable to a customer. Everybody in the organization is in some way or form directly accountable to a customer. And it's the same, it's the same mantra that that CEO um, had. I really like that, that idea. And the same extends to AO. This, can, I just, can I just cover one key point yeah, sure. here? Um, which was the, it was, you either help, you're helping a customer or you're helping someone who is helping yeah. a customer. So that for all the people who didn't have direct contact with the customers, Right. Our goal was to help the other team members that we we're working with help customers more effectively. So making the teams more productive, able to offer a better experience. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't just about the customer. It was also about helping people get better at how they could serve the customer. Yeah. But the key thing here is that there's no such thing as an internal customer. Mm -mm. They're not no, a customer, exactly. they're a colleague. <laughs> it's a different different word, different meaning altogether. Because if an we're doing, that's right. But if we're doing really well here, but there's no impact to the customer at all, we're not doing well at all. <laughs> we're just wasting yeah. time. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, it's kind of one of my, one of my um, bosses at one stage said, nobody's going to, no competitor is going to jump up and run away scared because you changed the payroll system. <laughs> Doesn't do anything yeah. for your customers. It looks after the people that you've got to pay so they get paid reliable, but it doesn't do anything for the customer. So yeah. this is really a, an important uh, point. So th there's two things um, that I'm uh, just two thoughts around this. The first thought is, is that any oversight a role is also going to need to consider what their impact is on the customer. Yeah, absolutely. That's very important. It's not I'm doing oversight onto those people that's doing work for the customer and it's not my problem. You can't have that mentality. Yeah. And the other you come one, back, come back to, yeah. So yeah. let me just come back to the, the the VI model, the value. Yes. Right. Sort of that that concept of why we're doing this. It's just so critical to keep it top of mind. Don't forget the bloody beach. Mm. That's what we're aiming for. We want to deliver this amazing experience to our customers. And I, I think the, there's a real issue where senior executives see themselves as more important than a person actually dealing with a customer every day. Right? Because the, the, I used to joke with my, with my leadership team, is I actually don't do much each day. <laughs> I just I, I just make it possible for other people to do great things. Mm. I, I, I enable people to deliver great experiences. I don't do it myself. And I think that's I, the, a message that a lot of 
senior leaders have potentially actually forgotten um, that the, yeah, I'm delivering through people, through the mm -hmm. efforts of other people. If they're not doing the right thing, I'm not doing the right thing. Uh, in a previous um, a podcast, we spoke um, and the um, interviewee said something like, uh, senior executives may say things like, uh, I expect you to fix your mess um, and uh, come back and tell me about how you've resolved the problems. And the, the key word there is it's not your mess. If I'm the leader, it's my mess. <laughs> It's not, yeah. it's not you fix your mess. It's I'm the leader. It's my responsibility. It's my mess. It's our thing to, to solve. It's our mess. Right? Exactly. So no, the, this, I, I spent, uh, worked in Fletcher Construction and one of the things that, one of the lessons I took out from there was the thinking about safety. That the, it's get, keeping people safe in, in these amazingly dangerous environments we expect people to work in, in on construction sites is 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 challenging and difficult and, and requires constant focus and i mean we still see the horrific situation where some people don't go home at night and the thing you've got to look at first is the system that allows the accident to happen mm. so what was it about the system that the person was working in that said that we could have this horrific outcome how did we let that happen? And so I think if, if a team is creating a mess, I think that says more about the systems and approaches of management of the organization um, than it does about the people that have actually ended up in the mess. Having said that, if they're constantly messing up and they're not learning um, from the messes that they make, then um, there may be something else going on. But in the sense of if this is someone who's normally been doing a good or great job and something goes wrong, right, don't look at the person, first of all, because it's probably not their fault. Mm. It's probably, a, I mean, it's kind of like the, um, these stores being down. <clears throat> Nobody was tracking the reliability of those systems in the stores. Now, mm. pretty obvious thing to be doing, but... The, the leadership before me hadn't rated that as a priority. Right? To me, it was a priority. So we started measuring it and we found out what was really going on. So we fixed it. Mm. Um, but yeah. the people, the software development team that was doing that, not their fault. Mm. They were doing what they were incentivized and paid to do. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing how we forget um, the lessons of history. I mean, um, oh, yeah. you, you look at uh, Paul O'Neill and his tenure at Alcoa, uh, it was just amazing, yeah. And, and some yeah. people remember yep. it, and others completely forget that he went to to Wall Street and said, "I'm going to focus on safety." Yeah. And everybody was like, "Yeah, yeah. Everybody, no, no. Perhaps you didn't hear. <laughs> I yeah. will focus on safety. <laughs> Get out of here with what uh, uh, financial yeah. returns I'm going to make. No, 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 no. It's going to be safety." And everybody thought, "Wow, you brought a hippie." Um, uh, it's going to ruin the uh, the organization yeah. and lo and behold because of his focus on safety and because of the um significant uh, structural changes that that required in terms of better communication and better sort of sharing of um lessons learned and so on very much like you were describing earlier with the 80 20 of, of yep. errors and, and defects dramatically reducing the safety um, yeah. sort of incidents radically sort of uh, improved um, the um, communication abilities and therefore the organization managed to significantly out yeah. outperform yeah. its competitors, right? So, wow, yeah. all of a sudden safety means really great business as opposed to we're yeah. going to chase great business and hopefully safety will come along as well as some kind of a side effect. The, uh, but again, it's about... The, that human-centered value. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Uh, a lot of a lot of what he was what he was focused on was enabling people to do their best possible work in an environment where they were safe and they could do it every day. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, another really interesting aspect that um, I want to commend you for for bringing to the surface in your book is this idea of economic quantification. So. Um, 
if people are familiar with the scaled agile framework, uh, there it's described as the weighted shortest job first uh, type uh, yes. uh, approach. Yep. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, some people call it um, uh, um, speed and acceleration to value. Others refer to it as cost of delay divided by duration. Uh, yes. But by whatever name you call it, it's essentially an attempt at understanding and, and framing what value actually is and then tempering it with an understanding of how long is it going to take to get to that. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Um, there's a, a, a potential. But, there's, there's, yeah. but there's a twist in that because yeah. the, the, um, the way I talk about it in the book, the, you don't actually quantify the values. Mm. The, the process that I promote using in the book is a is a is a mechanism to re, to measure the relative mm -hmm. value or the relative contribution or the relative risk between opportunities, mm -hmm. and it's about working with the organisation that 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 are going to produce and consume those changes mm. to actually understand. Well, let's look at the business value. Now, which one is the most you think is going to give us the most value? Stick it at one end, and which is the least? Stick it at the other. Now, right. let's fit all the other opportunities between them. So, there's not a lot of quantification in there, but there's an awful lot of comparative discussion going on between these decision makers mm -hmm. to understand how they got that sequence. Mm. And, and to me, that's the that's the critical thing. You can spend all the time in the world actually quantifying things. Um, and a certain degree is absolutely useful, absolutely worthwhile. But at some point, it's coming down to getting people to buy into the sequence that you're actually delivering. And you and created... Getting the dis Sorry. Go ahead. Go and you created the environment uh, in which those discussions can happen. Um, then exactly. it's not a then it's not an, uh, uh, a a, com a competition uh, between people. It's actually collective decision making. Is that hey my my oh. initiative here is actually more valuable because of the following reasons, and then the person next next to them can say yes, I understand that. Um, yes, I agree. Or no, I agree because of these points, and they they actually work it out together. The, I've I've run similar workshops uh, with with senior leadership uh, in in a ministry here, yeah. and the value was in the conversation. Absolutely, yeah. yep. And the commitment that brings to the sequence. You notice I don't use the word priority very much in the book. Mm -hmm. The the thing for me is it's about what's the sequence we're going to follow to get this work That's... done, and, and part of the reason I do that is you can always have more than number one things that are this is my our number one priority we got seven of them, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah and, and it is kind of like but in a sequence there can only be one yes, and yeah. so by agreeing that sequence of and and helping that being guided not determined by that quantification process or that discussion process yeah. um, that people, I think the quality of dis debate and quality of decision that can be taken um, can be dramatically accelerated. Um, the, yeah, can be dramatically accelerated. Let me leave it there. <laughs> yeah, and well, that's the challenge that I think you've cut through re really beautifully this way, because as a relative evaluation, you're not falling into the usual prey of quantification, which um, hones in on dollar value, right? So you're not just jumping on how much money is this going to bring in? It's more uh, a more integrated conception, well, isn't it? You've, I've, I've never run into an organization that has enough resource to do all the initiatives it wants to do. That's right. Um, demand always exceeds supply. Mm -hmm. So the decision you're trying to take is, which is the next best thing for me to do? Mm. Right, it is. It's and the, the deciding that and um, deciding what not to start yet <laughs> um, means you can actually balance the work in progress across your teams mm. much more effectively um, than than using other approaches to actually defining your portfolio and your program of work. 
Yeah, I mean, I and, remember the the work of um, the Beyond Budgeting um, uh, commun a community, um, where essentially what they're yeah. trying to do is is get away from this silliness of we must spend all the money that we've had in the budget so we get uh, at least the same budget next year, right? So it's like, oh. come on, <laughs> come on. I, I worked in public sector organisations where, the, where there's always the tick up at the end of the year where we've got to consume our budget. I've never believed in that. Um, if the and and I've been lucky enough to work for people that didn't manage me on that basis, that they they looked forwards to see okay what are you going to deliver mm. with this money, mm. not manage on the basis of an arbitrary number of a budget, um, and the that allows you to have some flexibility about what you change during the year. It's kind of like going back to that long distance swim that when a storm blows up um, and you, you need to get out of the water to be safe, right? You're, never, you're not going to make that beach. You're not going to complete that, that project that you started. But that's a completely valid outcome because I didn't drown that day. <laughs> <laughs> and, and organizations, I think, are, are try to push through on completing stuff. That actually cancelling things, stopping stuff that's not working, or stopping stuff that's not the best thing to be doing right now, um, is undervalued by many organisations. They value completion too highly. They don't value re 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 jigging our work program to suit yeah. our changed circumstances. I think COVID was really an effective lesson for people because it was dramatic enough that our plans were just no longer appropriate. Yeah, yeah. So we had to bring some degree of agility and flexibility into our business plans. We just didn't yeah. have a choice. The, the sunk cost fallacy is is actually a, oh. a, a, a big challenge, isn't it? And not yep, only that, it is. but also culturally, um, we're not good yep. as um, organizations and, and individuals at overcoming willful blindness. Um, yeah. th that's. Uh, I think it. There's, there's, a, there's an even, for me, there's an even more critical message in there, which is you are where you are and you can only change what ha what's going to happen next. You, you can't change what's happened in the past. Mm. So if you, so learn everything you can from it. So the next decision you take is better than the one you took before. However, we do see, and not to make a counterpoint, and it's a pretty valid point, Alan, I do see, however, a, a very healthy practice of organizational amnesia. Hmm. Um, we've, we've, we've learned this lesson, um, and we keep learning the same lesson. How do you safeguard against that? That's a broad question, but... It there's a um, one of the things I found working in the construction industry is the length of a project when you're building major infrastructure, um, like City Edge, um, sort of east east or east east of Hamilton, um, part of the Waikato Expressway. That was a six year project, I think. That that kind of duration, and so senior engineers that actually working on those kind of engineers working on those kind of projects in a, in a 25 year career may work on six of them or five of them that's five learning cycles so they've only start by the time they get to run the big projects they're the the most senior project director they've run five projects so they've only done this five times you compare that to a retail organization that has the supply chain that that's doing multiple deliveries to a store every day, your learning opportunities are dramatically accelerated. An organization that fails to learn, what's that cliche? Fails to learn, learns to fail. Mm. I think it is absolutely true. And again, the going back to the Trudeau quote, with the pace of change accelerating, those organizations that fail to learn are going to fail faster. They're going to be exposed. Um, if you look at a lot of uh, 
at the moment, the building industry in New Zealand and Australia is going through some pretty traumatic times um, because of supply chain issues, because of shortage of labour, um, because of the nature of contracts that are written um, to actually delivering things. We're seeing um, an increasing number of building organisations go into receivership. Um, and, and this is something that this industry goes through in a regular cycle. Mm. Right. So it's so what is it about this industry that means we have this boom and bust type um, situation? Um, and some say, well, it's a free market. And I just don't accept that, that the mm. that we're not that big a market in New Zealand, that we can't actually with some more effective thinking about how we actually do this. Yeah. That we can we can actually create demand in the right sorts of ways, that that, that it's built consistently, and we don't put people through the trauma um, of organisations failing like that. So it's, I think that ability to learn is just got mm. to be fundamental to organisations. The ability to solve problems is such a critical skill for people today. Yeah, um, that's a really interesting um, observation. I came across uh, another uh, founder of a um, small but very successful business, and he was saying, uh, you know what? Um, I've reinvented the word uh, problem in our organization. Yep. We're not using the word problem. I don't have people coming to me and telling me about problems anymore. We always talk about challenges. Yep. So, yep. hey, hey, Dan, here's a challenge. <laughs> Whoops, that's tricky. How the heck are we going to do this? But somehow you figure now, it out and, and you do better. You're, yeah. you're not. But it doesn't change the, I mean, the semantic redefinition of it. Sorry for that. Um, the, the, the semantic redefinition that's going on in that is useful because it makes people, I'm sorry about my dog, makes people think differently. But I, but I really don't think it's helpful in the long term. Yeah, yeah. To, well, be, to, to, to sustain that, you'll still need those problem challenge solving skills. Those skills. And, and that's the thing. Change. Just what he was emphasizing is this idea of problem gets you into this idea of an obstacle that kind of perhaps stops you, whereas you never fail he says right because you you're either learning or you're succeeding at whatever it exactly. is that you were, you were challenged win. with yeah yeah <laughs> but that, that's, a, that's a radical kind of tenacity if you will that, that's kind of built in so it's not you're sweeping problems under the rug or you're not looking at things uh it's it's kind of a bit the opposite to say everything that may present as a problem you don't think of yeah. it that way you think of it aha it's an opportunity right so it's fairly it's, stoic in in perspective as seeing the obstacle as the way yeah. <laughs> right so well the that goes back to what i was talking about with lemons and roses before that learning mm. experience of the month we didn't look at them as problems or failures that had happened right we celebrated the fact that we actually learned things when things went wrong You, um, on Management 3.0, they have a really wonderful tool um, that I've used a few times. Um, it's a, where you celebrate the learning. It's a learning celebration grid. And it, it's fascinating where you also celebrate your failures and it's exactly the same type oh, of thinking. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's, uh, so if you're, you're not celebrating, let me, let me be clear about this, because I think sometimes the, the term fail fast is um, focused on too much. It isn't the failure that's important, it's the learning from yeah. the failure that's important. Yeah. If you, if you just fail and you don't learn anything, that's not you useful. Fail. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly... Um, uh, uh, that, that. Anyway, coming back to learning, sorry, I, I'm... I should not have sat down while I was busy trying to formulate a question. <laughs> uh, so looking at learning, and I wanted to bring that again um, into uh, the oversight uh, or the, the, the more traditional view of, of governance in the organization. Um, usually the parameters by which they oversee or govern are really narrow. Um, and one of the things that is an idea, I'm putting it out there, 
that they also perhaps need to oversee or govern is the learning that happens in the organization as an added parameter by which they need to oversee or govern. Yeah. Or I figure every, every organization has only got three things to play with. Yeah. Um, they've got people, um, they've got time, um, and they've got resources, frequently money. Yeah. Um, and those are the only three, three things you've got to play with. Learning takes time and resources and people. And so if the, in exactly the same way we talked about the continuous improvement, um, taking time to learn is an investment in productivity. Mm. It's, not, it's not a negative um, input to your organization at all. It's about recognizing, hey, well, this is a great, well, what's that old cliche about never waste a great crisis? Mm. <laughs> because there's so much you can learn from them. And the, the, that ability to, to fail and learn, figure out what do we do wrong? What can we do better? Um, and, and oftentimes you don't actually know the answer. You, you just, you're trying something different. Um, that one didn't work. Well, let's try something different and this may be better. And it's a, and again, it comes back to that, the how you're delivering that digital transformation is, is that evolution in your capability. Um, the taking those opportunities to, well, that didn't work. Okay, well, let's try this. Um, think about why that's better than what we did before and experiment with that. So at the, at the at oversight level, they have to allow the time, the people, and the resource to learn. Um, if they don't allow it, it's not going to happen. Yeah. If they and don't yet, drive it, it's not going to happen. And yet we do see that that mantra still um, very much entrenched in, in many organizations is that um, decision makers don't see learning as happening and is supposed to happening in real time in the organization. Learning well, is happening that you send somebody on a training course, they go no, learn there. No, no. <laughs> I, 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 this, I, I kind of um, repurposed a couple of supply chain terms, just in case and just in time. Mm. And a lot of training that organizations use the traditional classroom or go off and attend something, they're just in case training. I think with the pace of change that's actually happening now, um, just in time is actually much more effective than just in case. So when you're in a situation where you need to learn something to improve, to, mm. to address a mistake or a failure or and just an opportunity to get better, learn it so that it's relevant and can be immediately deployed and used. Mm. A lot of the just in case training, I, I can't remember the actual stats, but it's horrifically low retention from yeah. just in case training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you have perishable skills, right? I mean, unless you practice Absolutely. the skill, you're, you're, you're done yep. for, right? And not yep. only that, uh, one of the things that I've noticed recently is I, I hear people saying, oh, no, uh, we're, we're fine as we are. We don't need no, no agile training. Um, because essentially what they're saying is, we've become accustomed to this agile thing being run really poorly. So it's just a seen as an imposition, as a, as a way of making life difficult, as opposed to understanding the essence of it, which is actually make life more enjoyable for everybody yeah. involved. Yeah. Very, so, very smart, very smart person. I've, I'm lucky enough to work with um, made the point or I get to talk to very often. Um, most people only think about three problems at any one time. And if that agile is not a solution to one of those three problems, they're, they're, not, they're not going to be interested. If there's other bigger worries that they have, that the agility is not going to solve for them. So I think that's a challenge for really understanding the person's context rather than saying, well, the person's, they're just resisting an agile. Um, mm -hmm. That we haven't yeah. understood their context well enough to understand how agile can help them with the three problems, that, those three problems yeah. that they've Yeah. And in today's state, I know that time will move on from this recording, but um, in today's state, there's all sorts of uh, talk of uh, the economy shrinking, there's the big resignation happening. 
Um, and you're not only competing out there for customers, you're competing for, for capability, for, for, for people that can do the work. Um, Agile is probably then the last thing on somebody's mind than to solving those big issues for their organization. It's and and all of these things are without being too to be too condescending, fads. Yeah. <laughs> um that so many of these terms that people, I mean, digital transformation is in essence a marketing term. Um organizations have been improving their performance in different ways for thousands of years, literally. Yeah. Um, this We're just using a different set of tools to improve it um, mm. that allow, that gives different capabilities. But the principles of changing a person's context haven't changed. Um, and so I think the that awareness of the what this who is this person what is their context what are they really worried about and how do we help them um is i mean i everything from waterfall to agile i've run and developed teams that use those methodologies um i've combined different components of the methodologies depending on the context of the of the of the outcome that we were actually trying to achieve um they're all just tools that suit a context. And when the context changes, yeah. um, the, the tool may no, no longer be appropriate. Yep. Um, the challenge is one of thinking as Agile and Waterfall being different kinds of tools, yep. as opposed Absolutely. to being, being on a spectrum. <laughs> yeah? yep. And therefore, yeah. you have people saying, oh, no, we don't need Agile. When, in fact, what they're saying is, I don't understand what Agile is, and I don't want it. Uh, because yep. if I understood well, what agility is about, is like depending on where you are, you will need some things that are more adaptable and some yep. things that are a bit more predictable. And you need to yeah. blend in. It's like you need Lego blocks anyway. <laughs> yeah, which Lego blocks? But then, are you to me, use? to me, that's our failure in communication. Then, yeah, yeah. That, that it's we're not understanding what the pain points for that person yeah. actually are, mm. and figuring out the tools that we have available to help them. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see that inability to get someone to accept, yes, I need to be more flexible in my approach to change. Yeah. Um, I need to be able to change my program relatively quickly as circumstances change. Mm -hmm. They get hung up in this vision of what they see Agile as uh, and don't recognize that yeah. there are some capabilities in there that will actually help them with those that pressure to change yeah. um, going forwards. This is one of the things that's fascinating about life in this universe, uh, in that as far as I'm aware of, there's no perfect way of life. There's no perfect economy. There's no perfect society. There's no perfect anything. But we can strive to yeah. perfect our engagement, our community, well, our economic outlook, and so on. Yeah. The, we can, um, again, it's kind of the, going back to the, the long distance swim, it's the next stroke you take is the right stroke to take because it improves the situation. Mm -hmm. It gets me closer to the goal that I've actually got. Um, the, and I think that's the, the key to it is that each thing we do improves the situation that we're in. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that those one percent changes every day. We go one percent thinking. <laughs> yeah, absolutely compounds dramatically, and yeah. so you don't. It's it comes back to that concept that I that I used in that model around evolution. Mm -hmm. um, it's about one percent a day adds up to some three thousand percent a year. Yeah, um, once you compound. once you factor in the compounding effect. Compound effect, yes. Yeah, but the thing is, those uh, changes that you mentioned, they're actually um, disciplined practice, right? Mm. So oh, you're, yeah. <laughs> um, you, you're saying yeah. discipline sets yeah. you free, right? Because that next stroke, that takes effort, that takes determination, that takes stickiness to say, you know what, I'm actually <clears throat> going to pull my hand and I'm actually going to stroke, as opposed to, oh, yep. I'm exhausted, I'm not moving anymore, let me just die. 
Yeah. Well, you've, <laughs> but you've made a decision, haven't you, what not to do? Um, and, and I mean, that is, that's a, yeah, there, there are, you always have choices. And I think if the choice you make improves the context for you and the people around you, that over in the long term, again, if you've got that beach, keep that beach in mind. This is what yeah. we really want to get to. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and I mean, the, all the carbon neutral problem, carbon cycle problems that we've got at the moment um, with, um, with warming are not going to be solved by anything other than continuously improving mm. um, the or redu continuously reducing the carbon we actually use every day. Mm. Well, um, frankly, uh, personally, I'm much more interested in carbon adaptability rather than mm. uh, carbon neutrality, if you will. Because you could, you could argue, I mean, again, this is just daydreaming here, that we get so good at extracting carbon out of the atmosphere that all of a sudden plants start going, oh, where's my carbon? <laughs> and we have a radical sort of temperature decrease. So yeah. I don't think that we need to go crazy with this, kind of way over in the other direction and go back oh, into an ice age, yeah. kind of snowball. It'd be, but, Horia, that would be a nice problem to have right now. <laughs> I, I get it, but I'm just, I'm just saying, let's not go crazy, right? Let, let's be mindful um, of, of, of being able to balance, right? <laughs> so. But again, it's that question of what's the big Best next thing to do. Mm. Yeah. Um, sort of once once we get the carbon levels down yeah, yeah. to to a more appropriate level, um, then reducing carbon isn't the isn't the best thing to do anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's just each time it's that stick your head up. Where am I? What's the next best thing for me yeah. to be doing in the swim that gets me to that goal that, that I'm trying to achieve? Mm. Yeah. Well, in some way, you, you can argue that at the moment, we can only hope that we don't uh, hit a nonlinear um, <laughs> yeah. threshold, oh, yeah. right? <laughs> well, we're heading, um, yeah. I mean, but, but again, this is the, the, the reality for a lot of organizations is that's exactly what we are. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the, there are a number of exponential changes that are actually going on already yeah. um, in our economies and our world. I mean, if you look at the um, uh, 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 an example I use in the book um, from, say, computing power and cost from 1975 to today. The computing power is, if, I think, the world record for the javelin in the 70s, early 80s was about 90 meters. Yeah. Um, if the power of that javelin thrower had increased at the same rate as the computer power has, that javelin thrower would be throwing at 100 million kilometers past Jupiter. Yeah, it's like, whoa. Yeah, it's just incredible increases in power and the, at, at dramatically changing cost levels. So, I mean, the QE2 was built um, about that same time. The late, it was about the late 60s, and it cost about half a billion dollars to build at the time in, in current money. If, we, if computing power, had, um, the, the cost reductions we've seen in computing power, it had cost about half a cent to build today. <laughs> exactly. Wow. Yeah. And, and so just the, the, the cost and, and power of computing that we've got today is just so much greater. And the, the exponential capabilities that that's now delivering, then we're seeing through the AI engines, um, this whole wonderful discussion around sentience of, um, of, of um, the, uh, the Google AI engine just insane discussion but anyway um but 10 years ago that com the computing power to to run that didn't exist mm. yeah but and but there, go on. Yeah, there are some really fascinating elements of um of difficulty right because 20 years ago people were saying oh um you, you may remember ray kurtzweil's singularity is going to happen just yes. after the year 2000 kind of thing bullshit nothing like <laughs> that came about and what we call today as ai is actually well hang on whoa, 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 just <laughs> stop for a sec so we are seeing human and we are seeing humans enhanced by cybernetics oh um, um people no can that, people yeah. can hit People can hear the singularity may not have happened, but a lot of things he was talking about are, are happening. Yeah, no, where um, I'm coming from is 
general intelligence is is not solved, right? So general AI, we don't oh. have it solved, yeah? So what we have is very clever Correct. algorithms, very powerful yes. sensing algorithms, very powerful assessment algorithms, very powerful yep. um, sort of um, yep. um, ways of, of sorting and noticing things. But general AI, um, and this is a really interesting uh, insight out of recent research in this field, is that it has to be about embodiment. You have to have a body. There have to be affordances uh, that you actually consider. It's a really fascinating uh, challenge of psychology because you think, oh, um, you open your eyes and you look and you see everything. Well, no, that's not how the mind actually works because you're yeah. not seeing a cliff, you're seeing a falling off place. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kid you not <laughs> yeah. yeah no it's the it, it's yeah well i'm, I'm it's delving into a definition research. of reality maybe beyond this podcast yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but the but i think the coming back to the context that puts organizations into that kind of exponential power and we're seeing some really dangerous misuse of data in mm. those AI engines because yeah, of yeah. the bias mm. or yeah. because of the historical problems that have been involved in them. But a lot of people don't actually understand those situations. Yeah. Yeah. Right? That they, that, okay, well, we've had this, our, our wonderful AI engine has told us this is the answer. Yeah. Um, well, let's go do it and without any explainability mm. or any understanding of the quality of the data that they've actually got coming, they've got supporting that model. And sure. so that I think that that whole concept of exponential change, and again coming back, going back to the Trudeau quote, um, I think that 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 kind of thing that people are experiencing every day. I mean, I, I just watched a video from the Wall Street Journal on the history of the iPhone mm. from when it was first released, and they did it in a really smart way. They looked at they they found a family that that had a, a a child born on that same day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and they and they looked at how that. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And they looked at how that child had developed um, in that iPhone smartphone world and how that um, affected how they um, interacted with people um, and the influence that, that the iPhone and the power and capacity and communication capability that device has puts into people's hands. Um, and, and yet we're going to see continued acceleration of what people can actually do have in there the power they have in their hands mm -hmm. yeah um, one, one thing sorry one thing that uh, comes to mind for me is when people talk about exponential growth or exponential um uh, development uh in my experience that's not strictly accurate from a mathematical uh perspective because there are limiting factors of population right so uh the concept of infinity and see the problem, problem is exponentially if you just have a few turns pretty yeah. soon you run out of atoms in the in the known universe <laughs> yep. right yes if you double and yeah. double and double right yep. so if you go uh, 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 10 whoa you can't count the quarks in the universe <laughs> there's there's too many but it's yeah, yeah ab ab absolutely but the and I, and I agree with you that strictly speaking the, and some of the exponential things we call exponential effects aren't. Yeah, it's but perhaps more geometric well. but than, they, than but anything they, else. Yeah, yeah. But it's kind of it's a semantic difference. That's right. We're that's seeing right, that's accelerating right. change, and the further yeah. you go up the curve, yeah. the faster the change becomes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and and, I th and that's the world. That's the world that we're mm. we're having to prepare people to be part of. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm reminded, I don't know if you've come across Frank Herbert, um, um, uh, science fiction uh, author. Uh, he, yeah. he, he's probably most famous for, for Dune, but yeah. uh, he also had um, a few um, novels around um, uh, George X. McKee, uh, agent um, extraordinaire <laughs> of, the, of the Bureau of Sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, the Bureau of Sabotage uh, is there because uh, governments have been taken over by AIs and the yep. pace of change is too fast. <laughs> and yep. therefore, so, yeah. there, there must be yeah. a Bureau of Sabotage yep. that actually slows things down. Slows things bit. down. <laughs> yeah.
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> to keep yeah. things manageable and, and safe for humans, <laughs> right? Yeah, that, so I thought that, that was this, such, yeah. a, such a, a far reaching, so, so far into the future <laughs> looking. Yeah, it's just fascinating. Yeah. Oh, it is. And, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an inveterate science fiction reader. Yeah. Um, and I mean, there's a, there's a whole kind of that theme of a governing body controlling the, the space of change. Um, actually appears in so many different, um, <laughs> so many different books and, and guises. But it, it, just all bring us back to the subject: of if you, if we can't manage an organisation effectively, imagine how difficult at managing the society would be. That's right. In that kind of situation. Yeah. So no, <laughs> not not, well, not a great um, way forwards in some ways. <laughs> Yeah, we, we have to overcome this human condition first. Um, so oh, all right. I kind of like humans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's the thing. There's great promise. So in closing, uh, Alan, yeah. uh, what haven't we asked that we should have? Um, just the... That, that's stopping. Uh, I think for me, one of the things organizations don't do enough um, is, is actually really thinking about the context they're in today. Mm. So we've done three months worth of change. Um, what's different now from when we started? Coming back to that swim, I've done 10 strokes, I've stuck my head up. Oh, the tide's running. I'm being pulled to, to my right, so I need to swim more to my left to actually counteract mm. the pull. And I think organisations that, that just, they get very focused on those outcomes and they see that as the most important thing and they've got to keep the focus on that and they've got to keep driving it, but they don't look up and check the horizon. Um, they don't look up and see what's changed about their context. And I think the one of the exercises I actually include in the book is, a, is one that you look at the blockers and your drivers, the things that are stopping you for advancing, the things that are pushing you to get better and the capabilities that you have as part of your organization, I think that evaluation is something organizations should do two, three, four times a year, depending on the environment they work in. But most organizations don't. They just keep pushing. Mm. Yeah, um, David Marquet uh, has a wonderful book, Leadership is Language. He talks about red work and blue work. And the red yes. work is the work of do, 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 do. And blue work is kind of exactly what you're describing. Kind of take a step back and reflect. Yeah. How, how, how is yep. it that, that we're doing? So too often um, by focusing, over-focusing on red work and under-focusing on blue work, we end up in disaster, right? Mm -hmm. he, he gives in that book the example of the... Um, um, cargo ship that managed to sail itself into the middle of a hurricane and, and sink right <laughs> from exactly that yeah. problem <laughs> so yep. whoops yeah. <laughs> so kind of but but, it, but what, what i find kind of fascinating well not but it's it's challenging for many organizations particularly public sector ones that there, there's a real trend now to criticize public organizations for spending money on taking people away together and I think the, that you need to put, to, to do this kind of evaluation, you need to put people in a different context than the one they're in every day. Mm. Otherwise, today's thinking continues to dominate that kind of reality check that, that you're actually doing. Um, so the, yeah, I think we've got to be a bit kinder to our public servants, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, per, absolutely. Per, 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 personal opinion. Yeah, yeah, no, I 100% agree. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm keen on redemption, not on criticism yeah. and demotion or, or cancelling, right? I think this whole cancelling yeah. people is, is very ill-advised. <sighs> it <Yeah. laughs> doesn't help anybody. It's not exactly. a good next step. Yeah. That's right, that's right, yeah. Well, on that uh, wonderful thought, I'd like to, to thank you, Alan. It's been right. tremendously um, enjoyable, very insightful. Um, a you. period of time really, really well spent. Um, I'm Horia. And I'm Aldu. Thank you very much, Alan. And good luck with the book going forward. Thank you. Um, 
we begin to uh, learn, learn more about that journey as well in the future. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for your time.